Welcome to our Monday Night Bible Study. Tonight we'll be studying Jonah chapter 1. <clears throat> Excuse me, that Jonah chapter 1. Uh, before we get started, do we have anyone that has any prayer requests? Yeah, Brother Green, uh, we have a, a, a little boy over at Goose Street Church Christ. His name is Carter. I can't think of what Carter's last. What's Carter? You know his last name? Anyway, he's about a five-year-old. He had a uh, some seizures this morning. They rushed him to the uh, emergency room. I think he's doing better now, but I'm just going to ask if you all would just keep Carter. His name's Lil Carter, if you could, in your thoughts and prayers that he'll have a, a speed of recovery, okay? Carter. Yes, sir. Thank you. Do we have anyone else that has any prayer requests before we get started? Yeah, me. Yeah. I just continue to have faith to overcome all obstacles in life. Most definitely, Jerry yeah, will do. Uh, go ahead, uh, Brother Cross. I know you have to type in your response. While Brother Crosby is typing in, just request, is there anyone else that has any pro requests? Okay, you got Brother Givens and Brother Crosby just asking for prayer. Most definitely. Um, let me see, is there anyone else before we get started? Anyone else? Um, Kenny Jones, after surgery. Uh, Brother Crosby, question, uh, prayer for a sister named Kitty Jones, uh, after her surgery. So, asking for prayers for that as well. Is there anyone else? Brother Javier, are you able to pray for us tonight? To open us up. If not, uh, Brother Stevenson, if you don't mind, my brother, would you open us up in a word of prayer? Sure. Sure, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace and mercy this evening in the name that's above every name, the name Jesus. Thanking you again, Father, for another day of life, health, strength, food, clothes, all your basic provisions that you provided. Everyone under the sound of my voice, Father, involved in this prayer tonight. We are truly and tremendously blessed, dear God. You have been good to us. And, Father, I pray that we learn as a people. People to count our blessings and father just realize father god that you you've been good to us to god all those who name the name of christ an opportunity to obey the gospel have our our souls washed by the blood of the lamb to be into the kingdom of your dear son is is father it's far more than father we could ever father deserve and we just thank you dear god for this grace and i pray that we will not take it for granted that father we will show our appreciation by being good stewards Father, over the things that you've allowed us to have, these, these precious faith, these precious riches, uh, the treasures, Father, that wait for us in heaven. If we remain faithful, Father, I pray that there be nothing on this side of heaven that will cause us to sell our spiritual birthright. Because, Father, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? What would a man give in exchange for his soul, Father? And the point to that statement is there's nothing worth it. So, Father, just help us to appreciate and, and, and just be uh, grateful and thankful. Father, be with our little Carter, who's, at, who's in the hospital right now, Father. We've been praying for him all morning. And, Father, just thank you, Father, for already the, the, the success that he's already undergone, Father. And we believe, Father, it's only because of you. And we just pray, Father, you'll continue to allow him to, to progress, Father, in his physical health, that, Father, we can enjoy a little more time with him on this side of heaven, that he'll grow up and, and even just remember this, Father, uh, it be your will to come out of it and just know it was nothing but the hand of God uh, that, would, that brought him out of this situation. And, Father, I pray we learn from this, dear God, as well. Uh, how, uh, and to learn to be thankful and uh, understand how how short life is and, and time is, and Father, that we should love one another and appreciate uh, one another because we're here today and can be gone today. Uh, Father God, be with uh, uh, Miss Kitty Jones. Our brother calls you asking prayer for uh, for her as she's coming out of her surgery. Just pray for a speedy recovery with her. Thank for Brother Crosby. We understand there's power in his God uh, who answers and hears the prayers of his children. Dear God, be with our brother Givens, dear God. Thank you for him. And, Father, just hold him up on every lean inside. Build him up where he's weak, uh, dear God, and strengthen him, Father God, in, in his life as he makes efforts to be the father, the husband, uh, Father, that you would have him to be. Most of all, the Christian, dear God. And just thank you for his, his heart, dear God, of, and his sincerity to just want to be and to do all that you would have him to be and to do. And, Father, be with our brother Jerry. 
And Father, as well, strengthen this dear brother, dear God. I pray, Father, that he'll keep his hand in your hand and do all that he can, Father, continue to fight the good fight of faith and put on the armor of God because we are truly fighting a spiritual warfare. It's not against flesh and blood. And so, Father, we must fight spiritual uh, enemies with spiritual weapons. And that's with your word of God and keeping our hand in your hand. Be with this study, Father, tonight. Bless your manservant, Brother uh, Leslie. Pray to Father that he will just say the things. Uh, that are according to your word, your will, that when the last amen is said on tonight, all of us can say with honest heart, we were glad, we were edified, we were built up in the most holy faith as a result of this time we spent together in studying Jonah. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that prayer, Brother Stevenson. Um, once again, everyone, we're in Jonah chapter 1, and I'm going to turn it over to Brother Landry. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Uh, good morning from here. <laughs> so uh, uh, we are studying just like Brother Green said. We'll be starting uh, the book of Jonah. It's an interesting book. One of the books of the minor prophets. We've been looking through several uh, of the books in the past. We just finished uh, Badiah last week. Uh, Brother Stevenson uh, took that, and we will be starting Jonah today. So by, by way of introduction, I would like to say a few things on this um, book before we go over to reading the uh, chapter verse by verse. Um, first of all, the name Jonah, actually, the Hebrew word Jonah is actually meaning dove. So that's, that's the meaning of the name, dove, like the normal dove, D-O-V-E. So, and, um, you know, Jonah is unlike other um uh, books of you know the minor prophets in the sense that while other books were more of a prophecy like god telling uh the prophets say this to these people tell the people this and uh, jonah is a little different from that uh, in the sense that it's more of a history of a prophet uh, who was actually sent to fulfill a mission he refused to go, and then at the end of the day, when the mission was successful, he began to complain and all of that. He doesn't like the fact that the mission was successful. And um, so when we read the book of Jonah, you will see that we have the story of a man running away from God, tried to run away from him, he returned to him. And then at the end of the day, you see that he came back to God. So, um, Jonah is also mentioned in the book of 2 Kings chapter 14. Let us quickly read that chapter. 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 23 to 25. Um, Brother Green, please help us with that passage. 2 Kings 14, 23 to 25. Let's see the name is mentioned there, and let's see some facts about Jonah that we can actually glean from that passage. You said Second King chapter fourteen, verse twenty three and twenty five. Okay, 20, yeah, twenty three to through twenty five. Yes. Okay, Second Kings chapter fourteen, verse twenty three. In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned forty and one years. And he did that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of Gath Heifer. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. If we pay careful attention to um, verse 23, you would see that Jonah actually prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam. And this Jeroboam here is the second one, not the first Jeroboam. So he prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam the second. That's one information we can get from that passage. And then if you look at verse 25, you would see that some more information about Jonah is there. 
one of it is that he uh, was we were told of where he actually came from. It was from a place called Gat Efa, if that's how it's been pronounced. That's that's the place. And then he was the son of um, Amatia, which we, we would also see in the book of Jonah. And so, uh, in the book of Jonah that we are about to study, he was asked to prophesy to a city called, or to go to a city rather, to go talk to them uh, to change. And that particular city is Nineveh, and it is the capital, or it was the capital rather, of um, Assyria. So, with that being said, I was just trying to give a little introduction or some points on, you know, who Jonah is or was, and, um, you know, the city he was actually uh, going to, and then the, the reign of the king in which he was prophesying, and uh, those are basically what we, and then the meaning of his name, like I said, is. Do. So let us, having said that, let us go over to the chapter and let's read a um, few verses, maybe verses 1 to 3. Uh, Brother Henry, please can you help us read verses 1 to 3. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee on the Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them under Tarshish from the present. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now, you see the very first verse says that, you know, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amatai. Basically, that's what we saw in Second Kings chapter 14, which we read, you know, the son of Amatai. So that corresponds, basically. And then verse 2 says the word that was spoken to him says arise go to Nineveh that great city and cry out against it for their wickedness has come up before me so we see that you know the the, the town uh, was actually uh, uh, very wicked and God has actually discovered that oh these people they are so wicked and he was not pleased with them so he wanted Jonah the prophet to actually go there and then uh, you know, talk to the people, but verse 3 says, Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Yeah, I, I would like to notice that very uh, phrase, the phrase from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, this is so funny because Jonah thinks that he can actually hide from the presence of the Lord. But he probably doesn't know that, you know, you cannot hide from the Lord. There is a hymn in our hymn book. It says, there is an all seen high watching you. All the day through whatever you do, there is an all seen high watching you. So you can't hide it from God. So Jonah thought that he could actually hide and um, the Lord would not see him, and then he was actually going. Now, it's actually a different direction that actually was actually going through. Uh, more like the opposite direction, if you look at the map and how all of those things uh, are being described, you know, you see that the direction that he was asked to go is more like a north from the northeast, while Tarshish is in the western side. So, Instead of him going to the direction that he was asked to go, he went to a different direction just because he wants to hide. He doesn't want God to see him. So he, he, I don't know how he's seeing God, probably seeing God like a human that you can actually hide from. So, But the truth of the matter is we cannot hide from God. Whatever we do, God actually sees us. And God has given him the instruction, go. You need to go. So he has to go there, but he doesn't want to go. And he's actually uh, hiding from God. Basically, that's what verses 1 to 3 is talking about. Before we go into verse 4, anybody wants to add to the introduction or anything? Hey, Brother uh, brother Leslie, a, a good study so far, but let me ask you something. When it says he's running from the presence of the Lord, uh, yeah. could it be that, that it's not really he's running because he doesn't think God doesn't see him? Could it be that he, it's saying he's running from the presence of the Lord in the sense that He's not going to stand before God anymore because he's running from the occupation or the mission that God wants him to do. See, because oftentimes when you find a prophet 
you know, that God would speak to, they were referred to as standing in the presence of God. And so the idea is they're standing in the presence to hear what God would have them to, 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 to say. They're talking to God, and then they're taking God's message to the people. And so could it be that what Jonah is doing, and again, we're just, I'm just throwing this around. He's just running. He's running from his job, his occupation of wanting to do what God wants him to do. He no longer wants to be a prophet. He no longer wants to speak for God, so he's no longer standing in the presence of the Lord to do what God wants him to do. Instead of trying to hide, I think he's a prophet, so he knows God sees everything. That's my idea. I think he knows God is a prophet. He, he's a prophet, rather. He knows God knows everything. But I think the presence of the Lord, it's kind of like 1 Kings 17 and 1. Uh, when you look at Elijah, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand. You see, so it's that idea. Elijah stands in the presence of God, and there shall not be due nor rain nor years, but according to my word. And so I, I, I'm looking at Jonah in the sense, right from the presence of the Lord, is I'm done being this prophet. God finds somebody else who will talk to these people. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah, in some context, you're correct that, um, you know, being in the presence of the Lord would refer to that. Um, um, I'm just looking at it that since it was it was said that he arose to flee to Tarshish, where he's actually going to the destination is mentioned from the presence of the Lord. You know, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid, uh, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he's contrasting the location that he is going to with the location that you know uh, he was asked to go instead that that was that was the idea i got but regardless uh you know either way he was disobeying god's commandments he was not willing to go uh, uh to obey what god asked him to do uh i, I think he, we, we are not far from it but the, the idea i got basically was you know him running to a different destination from from what uh where he was asked to go but like you said, I don't think that might be an off a point. That might also uh, be the case. I don't know if. But I think, in some sense, and this is just me, in a sense, this is for our learning. You know, in some sense, I think we run from God the same way. We look at Jonah and say, we're running from the presence of the Lord. You know, but we can do it as well. You know, as Christians, they in heart and spirit, not come into service, running from the Lord. I want to do my own will. You know, I want to do what I want to do. And so in that sense, I don't, I don't care what God says. I want to do my own thing. And so in that sense, I think we run from the, from the presence of the Lord. And even, you know, sometimes even when our will, and this is what I want to say too, when our will sometimes matches God's will, sometimes I think we're doing, we're, we're doing, we act like we're doing God's will, but at the end of the day, you're really doing what you desire to do. See, that's still running from the Lord. If you're doing something because, well, there's nothing better, or it's what I want to do anyway, you're still, in a sense, running from the present Lord, because the only reason you're doing it is because you want to do it. And see, uh, and so in that sense, you're also running from the presence uh, from the presence of the Lord. When you're only doing something because it, you, your will now is matching God's will, instead of doing it because it's what God wants me to do. Even if I don't want to do it, if it's what God wants me to do, then I am going to operate in the presence of the Lord. But when I don't do that, I'm not. I'm running from the presence of the Lord. I'm not doing what God would have me to do as a Christian. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for for that. Um, that's that. That's a good one. Uh, like I said, that's that's one way that we can describe uh, you know people neglecting God's um, instruction and um, you know running away from what He has called us to do. We're running away from His presence and. Yeah, that, that, that's fine. That, that's fine. Thank you very much for that. Um, any other comments or thoughts on uh, the uh, yeah. question? Yeah, yeah I, would, I would actually take it maybe a half step further and say that uh, Jonah, uh, if he's a prophet, he, he may know he can't learn from, the God, from God. But, uh, but we know that he's not taking God's rule or, or his or command seriously. And I would, I would, I would uh, uh, assess that with 
present day. I think Christians, even those in the Church of Christ, just don't take the commands of God seriously. And I would uh, akin that to what uh, what Peter had to get uh, what Peter had to get chastised by by Paul when he did not choose to sit uh, with the uh, uh, Gentiles anymore. He just didn't take an aspect of God's uh, God's command seriously. So he thought just like Brother Stevenson said, I could do what I want to do. And I think that's in the present day context more so that we tend not to apply God's word. We just go do whatever we want to do. And uh, it's not right. It's not godly. And God will hold us accountable as well. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments or <clears throat> questions regarding those verses? All right, so um, we will take a few more uh, verses. Let's take verses 4 and 5. And Brother Dave, can you please read verses 4 and 5? Verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the Lord's parts of the ship, and lay down and fell asleep. All right, all right. So we see now that he has actually uh, entered the, uh, he has begun the journey, and then he was on his way. But we see that the Lord actually sent out a great wind on the sea, and, you know, there was a great tempest that, you know, was affecting the ship so badly. And so the mariners were so scared, and, you know, you see that people, of the Gentile world had different gods, and every man had to start to call upon his own god. Uh, at the same time, while they were calling upon their god, uh, they were trying to um, solve or save the situation by throwing away load, you know, in the ship. They were throwing them away so as to lighten the ship in order to prevent them from sinking. So that's basically what. Uh, these two verses is saying, but you know, while all of, all of this is being done, Jonah had actually gone into a different section of the ship and he was actually sleeping, so he wasn't even, you know, <laughs> he, he didn't know what was going on. So you will see as we read further that he was actually called upon and, you know, someone had to call his attention. So that's, that's what we'll see. So one of the things, and you, once, once we read further, you will see how, um, kind and loving the Gentiles were, uh, they were so compassionate that they didn't even want to allow Jonah to die. Uh, but we see that Jonah, who was supposed to be compassionate, a man of God, was not compassionate. He was actually wanting the people to perish. So let's go a little further. Let's read verses 6 to 7. Uh, Brother Coffey, please, can you help us with that? Uh, yes, uh, verse 6. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so, be that God will think unto us that we perish not. And they said every one to his, his, to his fellow, um, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for, uh, for whose cause this evil is upon, upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. All right. Thank you very much. So you see that the captain actually came to wake him up and, oh, what are you, what are you doing? You know, we have a serious situation. You know, I, 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 I remember this movie, uh, uh, Titanic. Maybe some of us are familiar with the movie. I don't know, but you know, that's one very, uh, movie that when you watch, you almost cry because you see how the sink actually went down into the water and, you know, it was so serious because even from the beginning, one of them said, even God himself cannot sink this ship and, you know, it actually sank. And that showed the power of God. So basically, you see that he was called upon, arise and, you know, 
call upon your God and, you know, perhaps, you know, your God will consider us so that we may not perish. Um, because they've actually called on their own gods and you know, nothing is happening. So they feel that, oh, probably Jonah might have his own God just like others because they didn't know him. Along the line, you will see they would ask him, where are you from? Who are you? And all of that. So uh, they asked him to call upon his God and they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lots fell on Jonah. Uh, lots is one thing that is so common in the Bible times. Um, even you remember that when Judas was to be replaced, Lot was cast, and several times even in the Old Testament that people cast lots, but you know, sometimes uh, they might use different things, maybe stone sticks or something like that. We don't know exactly how it is done, but you know, we just know that's a way to determine something. Um, so basically, they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah, that he was actually the cause of the situation. Before we go further, do we have any questions or comments? I see a hand, I don't know, was it Brother Jerry? Yeah, it was me, but it was not him. Of course, I was asking, like, hands and lots, I mean, they made a vote, right? Like, how many hands, like, how many people say this at that time? So, sorry, I didn't get you. Did you ask a question? Can, can you say that again? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Let me, let me make sense. Sorry. Cast and lots mean they made a boat, right? They made a boat? Yes, that's what cast and lots is. Oh, casting lots. Oh, yeah. oh. We don't know exactly how, personally, maybe some might want to throw like that. We, we, the, the, the process of casting lots is usually not given. Uh, so we don't know what exactly they did. Maybe they, you know, one thing I might use in, in making an example is, you know, when you want to throw a, a die or toss a coin or something like that uh, to determine something. But, but from, uh, from what we are seeing in the Bible, we don't really know exactly how or what they did to determine it. But, you know, the loss was something that was common in the Bible types. All right. Thank you. Okay, I see Brother Do Donald, Brother Henry, almost at the same time. I, I don't know which came for first. Well, wait a minute, Brother okay. Donald, though. He may go. Okay, Brother, brother Donald. Donald. Oh, I was just saying, my brother, I wanted to uh, uh, read a verse out of Proverbs uh, chapter 17 and verse 33, uh, referring to Lot. 16. Uh, Proverbs 17 and 33, and it reads, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And so, yeah, they were cast in lots, but God is always the one to determine and show forth who is or who isn't. Now, that was my comment, my brother. Thank you. All right. All right. Yeah, thank you. That, that was very clear. Even in the situation of um, Judas Iscariot's replacement. So, so they cast lots and the lot fell on, I uh, think, Matthias. So out of Joseph and the other guy. So yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Brother Henry. Yeah, that was Proverbs 1633. And that's what I was going to use, uh, uh, use to, Brother Donald. But I also want us to go back to verse 4 because I want you to see what, what God is doing with Jonah here. This is mercy. So even though Jonah wants to operate outside of the will of God, I love verse 4. But the Lord sent out. But the Lord sent out. See, because God, because of his love and his mercy, he disciplines all his children. You know, he, he's, he's, he disciplines. Actually, mercy, God sending out a wind into the sea, a mighty tempest to see that the ship would like to be broken because he's trying to get his attention. And so what God does for you and I today, when we operate outside of the will of God, or try to run from the presence of God because I don't want to do God's will. I'm not going to come to church because I know God's going to, I'm going to hear something that's going to make me uh, mine or act right or change the way I'm acting. And so I'm running from the presence of the Lord. You're not going to be successful. God is going to, there's going to be some things that's going to happen in your life because we do have a great heavenly father who loves all his children. Well, God will allow things to happen in your life to get your attention. And so what we're seeing here is the disciplined hand of God uh, for a child of his that is being rebellious. Because that's really what Jonah is at this time. He is rebellious, rebellious, rebellious. And, and another note on that is, notice this, when you out, operate outside of the will of God, 
you can't go nowhere but down. I mean, that's just all true. He's going down the job, but down into the bottom of the boat. Down, down, down. Because at the end of the day, running from God's presence, gonna, it, it, there's nowhere else to go but down. I'm telling you, if you don't fix it, you end up in hell spiritually. And so I, I want us to see the love and the mercy from God as we study this as well, even the Jonah in his rebellion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any other comments? Uh, yeah, I would simply add to that that uh, when you yourself run away from the, the will of God, you can bring other people down with you. Uh, we see that these mariners were afraid, and they had to do everything that, that helped, uh, basically help uh, save their lives, not really knowing at first that uh, Jonah was the cause of the problem. So when we uh, disobey God, we have to be careful with those that are around us, family, friends, job, and even the church. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of those beautiful comments. So uh, I think we'll continue now. Let's read verses 8 to 10. Um, um, Brother Musgro, can you read that for us, please? Verses 8 to 10. Yes. Then say they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thy occupation? And when come thou? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven which have made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we see from verse 8 that, you know, it was discovered that, you know, verse 7 made us to understand that the Lord was actually uh, showing that Jonah was the cause. So they said to him, oh, what, why, where, what is your occupation? Where are you? They want to know him and all of that. So he introduced himself and said, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So we see that the men were actually scared. So the Bible says they were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? Which means that they actually realized that, you know, God Almighty is, you know, is all powerful. And, you know, so they were scared. So why have you done this? And the man knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had actually, you know, told them, of course, that he had said some information to them regarding what, you know, he had it was he had done rather so all of this proved that you know the the men in the uh, uh, that they were on the journey together they were actually afraid and you know all that they are actually after now is why would you do this to the creator you know almighty god and all of that and as we read further you will see that they are trying to look for a solution to the problem and we would see what actually happened later uh, basically that was uh, pretty much clear on that do we have any question or comments on these verses so far okay i think the verses are clear so let us read uh verses 11 and verse 12. uh brother don't add Okay, yes, verses no, 11 and 12. Okay. Yes. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wroth and was temperate. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. All right. So um, they went out after what they would do. You know, the problem is there already. What should they do to actually solve the problem? 
So they said, what shall we do? That the sea may become for us, for the sea was way more tempestuous. And then Jonah said, pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. So the prophet now made it clear to them that, oh, uh, actually, the what is happening is actually as a result of what I have done. So he told them that they should actually, uh, you know, throw him into the sea. But along the line, look at, let us notice something here, that the men were actually interested in knowing what they would do to have all of them, you know, to be saved. If you read further, you will see that they were even reluctant at the time to, they didn't want to throw him into the sea. But it shows that the, the, the individuals, the men, were actually a bit compassionate. At least they know that they have to have love for one another or they should be kind towards one another. But this is one thing that, you know, God told Jonah, go to these people, to, to the Nineveh, and, you know, speak to them because of their wickedness. But Jonah knew when we get to chapter 4 that God is so kind, he's going to forgive them. So because of that, he wanted them to perish. So, but as, as Christians, we shouldn't, um, you know, uh, want our enemies or those who are wicked to perish. What came to my mind is Ananias and Saul when he was converted. There is a similarity somewhat. You know, when Saul, Saul was actually persecuting the church, and when Ananias was asked to go lay hands on Saul, he was arguing with God. He said, no, that man is a terrible man. You know, he, we have heard a lot of things that he has done to the Christians, to the disciples. So allow him to suffer, allow him to be in darkness there and all of that. But, you know, God had to tell him, no, you have to go and um, uh, uh, lay hands on him and let him receive his high sight. So uh, sometimes as humans, we are tempted to be happy when evil things are happening to some persons, maybe because we don't like them or maybe because they are enemies of God. But, you know, we are always expected to be to, to be to not be happy. Rather, we should pray that people should repent. That is the prayer. Denominational churches often pray that God should kill their enemies. You know, it's so common among the Pentecostal churches, kill our enemies. But as Christians, uh, you know, even back in the Old Testament, God has always desired that we do not rejoice at the downfall of our enemies, but we should always desire to actually want them to repent. So I, I would um, take some comments now. I see Brother um, um, Coffee and then Brother Lewis. Um, I just want to make a quick comment on verse number 12 where it says, And he said unto, unto them, Take me up and cast me into the sea, so, so shall the sea be calm unto you. Uh, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is, is come unto me. And what this reminds me of, after all is what is all the rebellious and the, di and the disobedience of what we see so far uh, with the, the decisions that Jonah is making, Sort of reminds me of the of the particle son um, in in Luke chapter 15 and verse number 17, where it says when he came to himself after all of the um, riotous living that he was doing, realizing that you know what he left he left comfort to want to go live, you know deal with the world, and yet the rebelliousness that you will see between Jonah and the particle son is pretty much parallel. And at this point, now the story is getting ready to change in verse number 12 because. You know, the main thing for us is, you know, it's one thing to to fall off, to drift, to, to fall away. But the idea is we need to come to ourselves, you know, and realize that, you know, when we find ourselves in sin, you know, we have to repent. And, and that's with godly sorrow so that, you know, we can be forgiven. Um, realizing that, you know, we're going to all fall short of God's glory, but that's not to promote that. But again, you can just see you know, the particle son, after all of what he decided to do, you know, he came to himself and realized the sin life he was living. And so he came back to repent is my, is my comment. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Brother Coffee. Uh, Brother Lewis. Yes, great comments uh, so far. Um, 
uh, I like Brother Henry and Brother Dave's statement about uh, Jonah going down to Joppa, down into the ship. Uh, my question is, at this point, uh, when Jonah says cast him uh, you know, off the ship, is this the point where his attitude is a repentance or is he still in a attitude of re, uh, a rebellion against God? That's my question. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you for that question. Okay, that, that's a very um, interesting question. I, I would think that, you know, uh, um, I would think basically that Jonah was possibly thinking he would die when he's been thrown into the sea, into the sea rather. And um, he just wanted to save the situation, do not want to allow, because of him, you know, allow this ship to sink or something like that. So he knows that when it's taken out of the ship, then the whole situation will be calm. So I might, you know, we, we, we are not mind readers, but I'm just saying basic based on all of this, because if you go over to chapter four, you will see that Jonah was angry when the Lord forgave the people. So I, I'm still trying to see how he repented, even though he finally went, but you see that he, deep down in his mind, was still very hungry, so I would I, I was think I would think that uh, you know he was probably trying to well let me just go out of this place probably let me die because of course when you throw a man into the sea the idea is that he was going to die. Uh, we don't have any record where God probably told him this is what you should do and then maybe this is the plan a fish will swallow you or something like that. So uh, that that's my thoughts on it. So if we have maybe any thoughts we can. We can take that. I agree with that, Brother Leslie. He's, yeah, this is not a sign of repentance. You know what we do when we repent. You pray. You know, and that's something we don't find Jonah doing. Everybody, it's amazing. You look at this story. The Gentiles are praying, but you not. Now, you're the one, a prophet of God. You're running from God. The Gentiles are praying. And you're the cause of the problem and the sin. And instead of repenting and talking to God and say, yeah, the, the storm is because of me. Let me pray to my God. Let me repent and let me get in the line of God's will. Just throw me overboard. And you're exactly right, brother. And Leslie, chapter four lets us know that this is nothing about repentance. This is nothing about repentance. And again, we're just going to see when the, the fish does come, uh, the whale swallowed him up. Again, you're just seeing God's mercy at the end of the day. God's mercy uh, is still going to be extended to Jonah. Even while he's casting, and it's sad. It, it, it really is sad to see somebody act the way Jonah is acting about souls that he didn't even create. It, it, it's sad. And I'm going to tell you, we have this mentality. We can have this mentality in the church and among each other as well. You know, I'd rather not, I'd rather die than let them uh, have the mercy that God wants to give them. I put my hand around their neck and strangle them until they give me everything, pay me back everything they owe me, what they've done to me. Uh, I'd rather kill them and be killed rather than just to do what God told me to do. And it's, it's, it's a sad commentary, brothers. It's just sad. Thank you. Thank you for that. A any comments on, on that? Okay. Uh, I believe, um, Brother Lewis, we, we tried in answering your question. So, <laughs> all right. So, um, we would continue. Yes, thank you very much. All right, all right. So, uh, Sister Stevenson, can, can you help us read verses 13 and 14? Verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it through the land, but they could not, for the sea rocked and was temperate against them. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord and said, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. All right, thank you, thank you very much. Now, you see, uh, one interesting thing in this place is, the men were trying all they could, humanly possible, to prevent the storm. But you see, this is God's work. And um, there is no amount of effort that, you know, anyone might put in, uh, you know, that would be compared to that of God's uh, uh, power. So the men tried everything they could, uh, you know, just to ensure that the sea is, you know, calm and 
back to normal, but it could not work. So, you know, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. Now, remember that they are praying to God here, the same God that they did not know from the beginning. They were actually calling on their own gods, their own, remember, from the beginning, when, when these old things started, each man, the Bible says, were praying to his own God. Well, at this point, uh, when Jonah said they should throw him into the sea, they had to pray. You know, they were so conscious of the fact that they don't want to be guilty of the blood of anyone. That's why they're saying, oh, we pray, oh Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood for you. Oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. Now you see that this individual has recog now recognized the God Almighty, that he is the one doing what is actually happening. Um, the people understood that it is, you know, a very dangerous thing for you to be accused or to be charged of uh, innocent blood. Oftentimes in the scriptures we see that this phrase, you know, innocence of the blood of men is, is used. For example, you see that um, when Paul was talking, he said he knows that he is free from the blood or is innocent from the blood of all men because he has not ceased to declare the, the whole counsel of God, the gospel, both from house to house and publicly. So that's basically saying that, you know, you cannot, the, 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 the destruction of an individual will not be old, it won't hold you for it. And then you see when Jesus Christ was about to be killed, the people were like, oh, let his blood be on us and on our children. <laughs> you can imagine that. So, uh, uh, but these people here, yeah, the situation was different. They said God should not charge them for this uh, innocent man's blood. Of course, they believe that once they throw him into the sea, he's going to die. That's why they're actually making such prayer. Do you have any comments? Um, on hey, that. Brother, good, hey, good, good teaching, my brother. But I, you know, I want to, I want to kind of defend Ananias just real quick because if I do make it to heaven, hopefully Ananias, hey, well, thank you for not putting me <laughs> in that category. You. you know, I want to defend him on on the part about you know him being like Jonah, not wanting to go to Saul. I think, and and I could be wrong on this. I think when I read him in Acts nine, Ananias that is, I think the reason he doesn't want to go to Saul is because he's afraid to be killed himself. Because he knows that Saul got letters. I don't think he's so not wanting Saul to not have mercy and to be forgiven. I think he's more afraid of uh, what will happen to him if he goes in the presence of Saul before he becomes a Christian. Because in Acts 9.13, the Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to this your saint at Jerusalem. And here he had authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go your way, for he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings of the children of Israel. So I don't think Ananias has the same type of spirit uh, here uh, like Jonah has. And so I think that's a different a different take than what Jonah. Jonah is really, like you're saying, in a good job, he's just very rebellious. You know, he just doesn't want to be in the presence of God. He'd rather die uh, than to allow God to show mercy um, to these 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 humans that were created in the image of God. Thank you, my brother. Yeah, thank you for the comments. Yeah, the, the, the link between the two, yeah, that I, I, that it, it might be possible that, you know, uh, Ananias was, uh, you know, maybe having a different mind from Jonah. But, you know, the link, there's the link I was trying to tie is that, you know, both of them were, you know, skeptical. Ananias, you know, Saul was a terrible man. That was the first thing he said. I have heard, you know, how, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Now, he brought up, uh, you know, if you go further, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So, he, he, he could be, like you said, uh, he was afraid. Uh, he could also be uh, that... Uh, well, this man is terrible. He has done so much. So let's leave him there. He probably is aware. You know, he's aware that Paul, that Saul was actually uh, blind. I want to believe that because he saw that in a vision. So 
Okay, so yes, if you read from verse 10, it says, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias said, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Arise and go to the streets called Straits and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his eyesight. So Ananias uh, possibly is aware that, you know, this man is blind. He's now praying, but, you know, he's just possibly not, he doesn't trust him as such. Like even when he received his eyesight and he was actually preaching, you remember the Christians in Jerusalem did not receive him. They were still scared until Barnabas had to, you know, come and then, uh, introduce him to the brethren and say oh he's a he's, he's a he's a good man and all of that so um the link i was trying to bring between two of them is that you know it could be possible we are not we are not already in mind but it could be possible that ananias because of the evil that he has heard about saul doesn't want him to receive his eyesight or something like that but god is seeing a different man that Ananias is not saying. So that was that was my point. Thank you for the the comments. Uh, Brother Javier, I see your hand. Yes, uh, not to go too far, but uh, just a comparison of uh, in chapter two. I don't want I don't want to go into chapter two, but he mentioned and he cried of his affliction, you know, and he said, "I'm going to pay my vows." You know, I want to pay my vows, you know, while he was in the fish. It just reminds me of, you know, the donkey that rebuked Balaam. You know what I mean? And the affliction of the of the fish is what caused him to, you know, caused him to say, I'm going to pay my vows. But when, you know, when he got to the land, he changed his mind after he seen that they repented. And so it just reminded me concerning what God used, you know, to to afflict or to cause a rebuke, you know, when it comes to Balaam him using God using a donkey to approve him, then God using the, the fish uh, to afflict him. And so he was afflicted, but, uh, and he said, I'm going to pay my vows. But once he, uh, got to the land and he, he, you know, paid his vows, he obeyed God, but still in his heart, there was some, some, um, Regret that he didn't want them to to repent. But I just wanted to add that concerning his mind, how it wavered when he was afflicted, and how it, you know, it changed when he got to the land. Just wanted to uh, show that in the scriptures. All right, thank you, thank you very much, Brother Javier. Do we have any other comments? Okay, if not, uh, Brother Javier, can you read the remaining past uh, verses, uh, if you can? Uh, Verses 15 to 17. Will do. Thank you. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have a couple of uh, points to bring out from these verses. Uh, we see that the people actually did as Jonah had instructed that they should throw him into the sea after they had prayed, Oh God, don't hold this against us and all. So immediately they did that, you know, it stopped. The tempest was, um, uh, that was raging actually ceased. Um, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered the sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. I can imagine <laughs> uh, such, you know, they were, I don't know who instructed them to make sacrifices anyway, but uh, they, they had to do that and, uh, you know, just to show their fear for God. And, uh, you know, they did that. I, I would think that this is a way of converting even the people. I know Jonah did not do any evangelism, but... Uh, you know, that was, you know, the experience, the situation that God has actually did or made in that particular situation made these people actually, you know, recognize the God of heaven and then the offer sacrifice, you know, kind of worship or reverence him and all of that. So we see that. And the next verse says that 
The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, a lot of people have actually uh, casted doubts upon the book of Jonah because of this very incident that, you know, a fish swallowed Jonah. I've listened to some people uh, try to argue that it was not possible for a fish to actually swallow Jonah. But, um, you know, what we see in the Bible, the fact that Jesus Christ actually made reference to this event is an indication that it actually happened. Uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 to 41. Matthew 12, uh, verse 39 to 41. Let us read. You see, Jesus Christ was talking. Um, Brother Lewis, can you read for us? I'm not the, uh, asked for the skip me. I'm uh, in the uh, in route. Okay. Okay, uh, brother Gibbons, can you can you read for us? I'm sorry, brother. What verses you need me to read? All right, uh, Matthew chapter twelve, verse thirty-nine to forty-one. Okay. Uh. Matthew 12, 39 to 41. Matthew 12, 39 to 41. Okay, let me get, I'm sorry. Matthew 12, 39 to 41. Verse 39 read. It says, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after their sign, and their ship shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonas was in the for three days and three nights in the world's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with his generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. All right, thank you. So uh, those who are casting doubt upon the the event that happened, uh, you know, Jesus Christ made reference to this event. Jesus Christ was not born as at when Jonah was, um, you know, in the belly of the fish, but, you know, he made reference to it, and he even made reference to the people of Nineveh, he made reference to the preaching of Noah, and he made reference to, you know, the repentance of the people so all of these facts actually show that this is real authentic and it happened live so uh, people should not underrate or underestimate the power of god it actually happened and so um, um that's what happened jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights so the bible says as jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights so shall the son of man be it's also talking about his death it's going to be buried three days and three nights and then he would resurrect a lot of people have tried to misinterpret the sign of jonah i've heard a muslim talk about you know jonah was in the belly of the fish alive and so jesus christ was going to be in the belly of the fish alive but that's basically not the comparison here you know the comparison has nothing to do with being alive or being dead uh but it's talking about the number of days three days and three nights so that's all for the chapter one the book of Jonah. Uh, do we have any comments or questions on these last verses that we've looked at? Okay, so if we don't have any uh, comments, I really do appreciate all of the comments and, and um, questions that were asked. And I believe, thank you, Brother Henry. I believe it's uh, you know uh, informative, and I appreciate you also, Brother Green, for the opportunity. Uh, I will turn it over to you right now. Thank you. Thank you, my brother, for, for the lesson tonight and, and great teaching. Is there anyone that has any questions or comments, whether it's concerning tonight's study or anything else at this time that you have that you may like to bring? But if we have no questions or comments, I just want to give a reminder tomorrow night, 7.30 Central Standard Time, 
on the Brother Stevenson Zoom page. Uh, we'll be continuing our lesson on uh, Kingdom Families and Kingdom Marriages. Brother Stevenson. Yes, sure will, Brother Green. I may do something around. I don't know if any of you all have anybody you know maybe dealing with domestic violence in the marriage. I'm thinking about going something along that route because we're seeing a lot of a lot of domestic violence and um, and, and uh, self murder, suicide uh, going on in our society. And so we just want to maybe share some things tomorrow night in kingdom marriages to deal with domestic violence, physical and verbal. Most definitely, my brother, and thank you. And also, uh, this Thursday, um, it will be the Lord's will, Jonah chapter 2. We'll have Brother Valer teaching uh, Jonah chapter 2. So I'll ask one last time, is there anyone that has any questions or any comments that they may have at this time? Is there any prayer requests before we close out? Right. If not, I'm going to ask Brother Gibbons, my brother, if you don't mind, could you please close us out with prayer? Yes, sir. I don't mind at all. I think that's about it. Uh, dear the Father, we come to you, Father God. We're so very thankful, Father God, for you opening up this avenue, Father God, to study another portion of the word. Father, thank you for being with your man servant, Brother Leslie, tonight, Father God, as he poured into us, Father God, the gospel, Father, rightly divided with no addition or subtraction. And Father God, as we partake the, up in this lesson, Father God, that each of us may apply it to our lives, Father God, as we continue to go out throughout the world, Father God, and face the wise of the devil, Father God, we pray that the things that were said tonight, Father God, we uh, use it as an example, Father God, for our everyday living, Father God, to be great stewards of your word. And Father, we ask you just continue to be with each and every one of us. Father God, the many prayer requests that went forth, Father God, and those that was unspoken, Father God, for you know all about it. Uh, we ask that you just bless each individual here by the sound of my voice. Father God, continue to be with us as we be good servants of, good servants of your word and the teaching and admonish one another. I uh, love, Father God, and strength and unity. Uh, we ask that you just uh, bless us, Father God, through the Zoom Avenue. Father God, we have opportunity to study your word, Father God, with saints all across this world. And we ask that you just continue just to be with us as we lay down and sleep and slumber in the image of death tonight, Father God, that uh, we ask that you protect our families from seeing and unseen danger. Father God, continue to be with us, strengthen us, encourage us, Father God, and just continue just to uh, bless us, Father God, with all spiritual understanding, Father God, that we may do the thing that's worthy and acceptable and pleasing to you and your son's sight, Father God. And these are the prayers we pray in your mighty son, Jesus Christ's name. Let us all say amen. Amen. Amen, amen Brother Daryl. Amen. Thank you for that, uh, my brother. And uh, in closing, as always, may God continue to bless and keep each and every one of you. Love you all with the love of Christ until we meet again. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.